Our second scripture reading today comes to us from the book of Exodus. Let us hear again from God's word to us in that book. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Out of the slavery, their cry for help rose up to God. God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why this bush has not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called out to him and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of a land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. To the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, the cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I also have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses came to God and said, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. But Moses said, Oh, my Lord, I have never been eloquent neither in the past nor even now that you have spoken to your servant. But I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord. Please, send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, What of your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he can speak fluently. Even now he's coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, his heart will be glad. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth, and I will teach you what you shall do. He indeed shall speak for you to the people. He shall serve as a mouth to you. He shall serve as God for him. Take in your hand the staff with which you will sh shall perform the signs. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
So we flipped text last week and this week, and if you were with us last week, you might have, at this point, a pretty good idea of why Moses is so reluctant to say yes to God's invitation. The cry for freedom and liberation is a powerful one, and getting to it is an uphill battle, to say the least. But what happens after that call is made? Then the work really begins. So if you're Moses, you have to worry about, you know, actually leading a large group of people, animals and things, through very difficult terrain, not knowing exactly where you're going or how you'll manage to feed and shelter and care for such a huge caravan. And then the complaining starts. Maybe Moses could envision all of this unfolding, and so he decided he was too old. He'd finally settled down with a wife and family, and life was good. And Moses knew that life had not always been so. So here is what we've missed in the grand scheme of things. We were with Jacob, who fathered a bunch of children. One of them was Joseph. Joseph was a beloved son who was sold by his brothers into slavery and ended up in Egypt. Through a series of remarkable events, he was elevated to become one of the most important leaders in Egypt and in the whole region, and eventually this led to his reunification with his family. Because of famine, Joseph brought his whole family into Egypt where they could live in peace and prosperity, and they did so, and it was good. But over the course of about 400 years, Relations between the Egyptian rulers and those descendants of Jacob had soured. The Hebrews were enslaved and forced into hard labor, and even then Pharaoh feared of their potential ascendancy. And so he ordered for all of the Hebrew baby boys to be killed at birth. But wise women, as women tend to be, found ways to subvert this decree One of those ways was with Moses when he was born. His mom made a basket. She kept him as long as he could, as long as a baby is able to kind of stay quiet. And then once they start making too many noises, she made that basket and she sent him down the river, hoping and praying that he would find safety. And he did with the daughter of Pharaoh. It was indeed a miracle. So Moses grew up in the household of Pharaoh, with incredible privilege. He was raised as an Egyptian, but he still knew his true heritage. It's a kind of identity crisis that many people feel these days in one way or another, not exactly fitting in this one place, but not really fitting in another either. When he became an adult, Moses made a choice. Maybe for the first time in his life, he started to become aware of the Hebrews who shared his ethnicity and started to see that they were suffering under forced labor. And he figured he should save them. And so one day he sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew and he kills him and buries him. And then the next day he goes and he sees two Hebrews who are just arguing with each other and he tries to intervene and one says, who made you boss or judge over us? Are you planning on killing us too, just like you killed the Egyptian? So at this point, Moses realizes two things. First of all, what he thought was his secret is not secret and he knows that's likely going to get him into hot water with Pharaoh. And second, His lineage was completely unimportant to the Hebrews. He wasn't really one of them. And he certainly wasn't going to be embraced as the leader that he thought he could be. And so he left. Finally, in Midian, he had a peaceful and settled life until that day he saw the burning bush. Addressing Moses by his name, God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. As far as God was concerned, Moses was still a child of the covenant. And God tells Moses of the plan to liberate the Israelites 
and then says, get going. I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Come again? <laughs> Had God forgotten how Moses left Egypt? That Pharaoh wanted to kill him? And what about the Israelites? The last time he tried to offer his gifts of leadership to them, they clearly were not impressed. He may have been Hebrew by birth, but he wasn't really one of them. Maybe Moses was just trying to get out of something he didn't want to do, and who would blame him? But maybe after all of those years, he still just didn't really know who he was or where he belonged. Questioning who he was, he also questioned whether he was the right person for this call. So Moses turns those questions to God. Who am I to do this? What if they don't listen to me or believe me? Moses wasn't eloquent, clearly not the right person for such an important task. And finally he says, please, Lord, just send someone else. He went away with awe and reverence at the burning bush and started backing away slowly. Thanks, but no thanks. Moses doesn't think he can do it, doesn't think he's the right person to do it, but God's call is persistent. Maybe it was because Moses straddled these two worlds. Maybe it was because Moses no longer wanted to lead this charge. But God know, knew that Moses was just the person to do it. When we read stories from the Bible, I think our natural tendency can be to read ourselves into the story. Spoiler alert, we're usually wrong about that. <laughs> Who do you think you are? For most of us, this answer is not going to be that we are the enslaved Hebrews or the wandering Israelites. Most of us haven't had the experience of living as refugees or fleeing home for safety. Most of us haven't been under the thumb of the empire, but if we're honest, most of us probably are the empire. We are the privileged. We are the ones who have been perpetuating 400 years of injustice and we're reluctant to see things change, knowing that it will likely lose some unearned privilege that we've come to enjoy and take for granted. Or maybe we see ourselves in Moses, coming from a place of real privilege, but not feeling really privileged. Maybe we feel like we're in exile we're out of step with many who may share the same privilege that we've enjoyed, but we're also not in full solidarity with those who are oppressed. It's not that we don't want to stand in solidarity, we just know that our experiences have been so different. What gives us the credibility to be a voice for liberation? It's complicated. But God knows each of us better than we know ourselves. Maybe you've heard that God doesn't call the equipped, but God equips the called. And whoever we think we might be, wherever we might tend to find ourselves in this particular story, the call is still clear to speak truth to power and to work for liberation. The best news in all of this is it really doesn't matter who you are or who you think you are. What matters is that this is about God. It's about God's work in the world. And only after Moses has long ago retired any of his hopes of leading the liberation, does God call him to do it. Moses said, look, I have no credibility. They're going to say to me, what, who sent you? What can I say? And what follows is in the history of our religion, a truly momentous event. It's the self-revelation of God's name. This is the tetragrammaton, the four letters, yod he vav he or Y-H-W-H, as it is often transliterated. This is the name of God. 
It's the name of the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God who will save. In many English translations, you may notice in your Bible, if it sometimes has the Lord in all capital letters, that is where in the Hebrew text we see the tetragrammaton. What does it mean? God says, I am who I am. But I love the alternate translation. I will be who I will be. It doesn't really matter who we are. All that is important is who God will be. And God will be with those who God sends to cry for justice. God will be with those who are being harassed and persecuted and oppressed. God will empower the powerless and give voice to the voiceless. And God works through us no matter who we are, no matter how ill-equipped or unqualified we may be. God invites us to wake up to our own privilege and to wake up to the injustices that we didn't create, but that by virtue of living in this society we perpetuate. God invites us to the deeply uncomfortable conversations speaking truth not only to power, but also to the ordinary. I know that as a white, cisgendered woman, I need to speak to my people, the Beckys, the Karens, and the Stephanies. And I need to go into the spaces as I'm invited where I am out of place and where my leadership isn't wanted or needed but where solidarity is important. Not because of who I am, but because of who God is. God is who God is, and God will be who God will be. We don't need a burning bush to tell us that God's anger burns hotly against injustice. And we can list any number of reasons that we aren't up to the task until we're finally exhausted and just say, Lord, Please send someone else. But still, God sends us. Not alone, we have our errands to accompany us. And God sends us, not empty-handed, even if all we have is a shepherd's rod. God sends us, not because of who we are, but because of who God is. The one who is, who is ever creating and recreating the world and us along with it. And God will be with us, keeping God's covenantal promises until all people, all nations of the world are blessed. Amen. Our hymn of response may be.